Holy possum. Possums are pollinators? Honey possums are tiny nectivorous mammals that are native to Australia and weigh only 7 to 10 grams. Honey possums are fantastic nocturnal pollinators and use their crafty feet and tail to hang from branches in search of sweet nectar from eucalyptus and other native flowers. They have long furry snouts that get covered in pollen when feeding and have long tongues with bristles perfect for lapping nectar from the flowers they are visiting. Right, Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so welcome to Thursday. We have a super fun day planned for you today. And um, if you got your party boxes, um, I am working on uh, my sunglasses that were in my party box that are very cool and, and fun. And then um, also I wanted to point out one thing in the party boxes that's there. Because yesterday we were talking a lot about food with our We Be Wild cook, and we had a conversation about pollinator-dependent foods. Um, and in the box, actually, is a little postcard um, by Dairyland um, that they included that has a, a list of foods that are pollinator-dependent. So I, there's, there's a lot of discussion about the foods and ingredients and all of that that was happening over chat and email. Um, during and after the party yesterday, so um, that was a very um, that was a very popular discussion, and we can uh, circle back to that a little bit more over um, over different conversations and chatting and emails and all of that. So I want to just point out Dairyland's card. And next slide. So another question that we've been sort of getting is um, why is the Electric Power Research Institute sort of hosting this party? Um, and I just wanted to hit on this point really quickly that um, we run a lot of, you know, much deeper research on pollinators and biodiversity and water and the food energy water nexus. Um, and this is just one of our initiatives. And one of the projects that we do in the Power and Pollinator Initiative every year is this sort of public education, public outreach um, event and commitment. And so the Pollinator Power Party is an artifact of that and really was born out of COVID um, because it was impossible to hold an in-person workshop. So we went virtual and it has just been a, a um, super fun and um, engaging event. And so um, that's sort of why we're doing the, the whole party, but we've been doing research on pollinators for um, about a decade and have things like our GIS and metrics. Next slide. And then related to today, which is all about bats, we have two um, bat research projects. One of them looking at artificial um, bat maternity roots that are um, put in right-of-ways. So the lines where power companies have their distribution and transmission lines create this uh, right-of-way. And we can use that as habitat opportunities. Um, and that, there's actually quite a lot of habitat opportunities in those rights of ways, which is um, another reason why working with power companies and helping them to think about what are ecologically successful ways to support pollinators is, um, is a big initiative uh, at APRI. Uh, so this is one of our projects, next slide. And another one is um, fat bats. Um, and Christian Newman at, at EPRI is um, one of our really awesome scientists, among others that we have. Christian is leading our bat research right now. Um, and he has fat bats, uh, which is focused on getting bats a little fatter um, and thereby reducing their, um, their possible risk of getting white nose syndrome. And white nose syndrome is the syndrome that you heard in the song that was released yesterday by Pond of Quicksand was um, talking about white nose syndrome and was really moving, right? If you saw the song release and the lyric video, um, that's part of what's integrated into that song uh, is talking about bats and white nose syndrome and, and the decline of bat populations in general as well. So we have much deeper research. The pollinator power part of Power Party is really fun and um, sort of is really biologists 
um, <laughs> we're at the end of the day, we're just a bunch of biologists sort of trying to get the word out and share some things that are um, pretty easy to kind of spread the word about. So, um, but if you want more information about our deeper science, that's certainly available to you and you can give us a call at any time. Next slide. Um, some of the questions about, hey, you know, why are you guys not talking about bees um, so much in the party? Um, last year's party was heavily focused on wild bees and bees. And all of our obscure pollinators were all different species of bees, which, you know, there's, there's 40,000 species of wild bees just in North America alone, right? And so we had some pretty detailed conversations about wild bees and honeybee and, and other things. And so all that content is still posted on our party last year, which was also a really phenomenal party. And we had keynote speakers from Xerces Society and, um, and scientists that came on with us um, during scientist speak section on Friday. So all that's recorded and posted. So if any of this is sort of getting your buzz going, <laughs> Um, get on and check out last year's party. It was really cool. And we even did pollinator friendly barbecue, Southern style. Um, so check that out um, if you have uh, kind of more questions. And it, we talk a lot about wild bees there. Um, that's why this year we kind of were focused a little bit more heavily on butterflies and bats and other pollinators on the science side. Okay, next slide. So these obscure pollinators, um, you hear you hearing these clips. We're just kind of sneaking them in there, just um, pointing to the diversity of different species that pollinate. Um, it is true that bees are the workhorses of pollination. They get most of the pollination service uh, completed, um, particularly for food crops. Um, and um, the honeybee, the Apis mellifera, is an important species um, for food crop production, and that's the species when you hear about colony collapse disorder and the waggle dance and these social colonies, that's honeybee. Um, that does not necessarily apply to other bee species, which um, the majority of bee species actually are solitary. So I'm just flipping in a teeny bit of science here. I'd love to get into more of that with you. And we will um, on another day. Okay, next slide. So um, you guys are sharing with us, and we love this. Um, sometimes it sort of feels like we're in a little bit of a black box um, on our side. We're just broadcasting out. I can't see you. <laughs> um, so um, tell us what you think. Talk to us. You know, send us emails. Um, share your photos. This is Don Huff. Shout out to Don Huff. Um, you're awesome. You posted last year um, on the screenshot on the left. He's listing songs and bands that are related to pollinators. So you got Nirvana, Sting, um, Pop, um, all kinds of stuff in there. So that's really, really cool. Thanks, Don, for thinking through that and sending us your brainstorm. Uh, some selfies in there. There's a guitar at the bottom, a Taylor guitar, in fact, um, that says Pollinator Power Party Rock with all the little origami stuff in there. So great, it keeps us going because, um, you know, we wonder, we wonder, you know, if we're having a reach and having an impact. So tell us if we are, um, so that we have enough, you know, drive to, uh, to keep the party going next year. Yeah, okay, next slide. Okay, so quick party updates. Um, the origami folding lessons are all posted to the origami page and under the relevant party day, they're posted both places. We're not going to have time to show you the bat fold today, um, so go check it out on the party page. That way you can stop and start and kind of catch up with that. It says it's simple. Uh, simple origami folds aren't always so simple. <laughs> um, and then all the all the all the days are um, being posted pretty rapidly after we close down. We have an awesome team at Epri that's just on the ball, um, and they're getting this thing posted. The art contest is still open. Um, and tomorrow is uh, Monarch Biology uh, with a world-recognized um, expert on Monarch, Chip Taylor, who's going to get us to brass tacks. What's going on with Monarch? He doesn't pull any punches. He's going to get us really from zero up to where are we at and what do we need to do 
with that species. And then we're also having a wild bee, well, a BID lesson tomorrow. So if you don't have the BID card, um, maybe take some time to grab that from our website, you know, tonight so you're ready to go with that lesson. Okay, next. Okay, so today, oh man, we have been waiting for today. Today is bat magic, right? How cool. Um, so we have some really awesome scientists from Bat Conservation International on. They are taking us into the field with their research site that they have on video for us um, and teaching us about bats. Um, this is gonna be an interactive day we're gonna do some live polling questions. So um, what you're gonna see is a little bit of content, a polling question, a little bit of a quiz, right? Um, to hear how you're, um, kind of what you're thinking, what you know about bats. And then we're gonna go into a really solid discussion with Mylea and Kristen from the Bat Conservation International about um, kind of more about what they're doing. And um, that this is gonna be a great day. So stick with us. And then we're going to go into story time, which is um, two power companies, Tennessee Valley Authority, um, huge amount of land and assets that they manage, and American Electric Power, also a large electric power company in the Midwest um, that covers multiple states in the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, all the way to, through Texas. And they're going to tell us a little bit about what they're doing on pollinators and their stories. Those stories that these companies telling are just amazing, amazing. You will learn what you go to one of those and you will, you won't be asking anymore. Why is electric power research Institute into pollinators? You will go to one of those and you'll get it. All right, next slide. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. I already mentioned this. You can pick up the full lesson from our website. Okay, so here we go. Let's jump in. Um, we're gonna go directly to a live polling question. So this is Poll EV, um, super easy to use. I recommend you do this on your phone. So grab your phone and um, you can text the word BAT to 22333 and it'll pull you into the live polling. You can also just go to pollev.com and enter the code word VAT, and it's gonna take you into this poll, okay? So that's what we do now. Um, so go do it, you have an action. Okay, Hannah, let's switch over. Yes, ma'am. And that, those numbers are gonna come up again in a second, so you didn't just, um, you didn't lose the chance there. And I'm doing it also. Okay, so Hannah's gonna bring up the poll in one second. Um, so once she grabs it, I got my text back already, super quick. I just texted 22333 and the word bat, um, and it pulled me right into the poll. Okay, so um, here is the question. It's asking if I'm a presenter or I'm a participant, just say you're a participant. Okay. So the question is, um, what comes to mind when you think about that? And this is gonna be a weighted word chart. So just enter one word here at a time and you can enter many, many responses here. It doesn't have to only be one word, it can, it can be many. Um, and the frequency that you guys put it in is how heavily it's gonna show up here, right? So I'm gonna let this run for a minute or two. Cool, vampires. <laughs> um, and Mylea and Kristen are watching and they're the experts, so not to stress you out. Okay, awesome, you guys are engaging, this is perfect. So the, the w new waiting is coming up. Somebody's trying to lobby for cute by entering that a bunch of times.
All right, we'll give this like another 10 seconds. My goodness, you guys are really, oh, golly, jeepers, that is so cool. You're entering like bonkers. Um, somebody's really getting cute in there. All right, <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, that's perfect. That's the initial kind of, you know, pull in here before you hear the lesson. We are going to um, ask you the same question at the end of this session, okay? So we're gonna see, we're gonna capture this. Actually, I'm gonna take a little screenshot here super quick. We're gonna capture this, and then um, when we get to the end, we're gonna see if it changed, okay? All right, okay, let's go to the next question, Hannah, please. This is so much fun, I'm getting distracted. Okay, what do you think bats eat? This is before you hear the, the content. Insects, fruit, nectar, or all of the above? So what do bats eat? <laughs> okay, so it changes, the polling changes like the percent, right, based on how many more people are answering. That's why insects is kind of dropping from pretty high to kind of getting low. Okay, they're pretty, <laughs> pretty clear on all of the above. That seems to be the consensus. I wonder if we're right. We're going to have to find out. I was wrong about bats. You know, bats are mammals. They have, they have pups like humans do, they have pups. And you think about bats and, you know, as a human, you're the mama. What would you not do for your baby, right? If you're a parent, uh, you know, I'll defend my kids until the end of time. And think about bats and their mammals. They nurse their young like we do. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, okay, so Hannah, let's close that poll. So most people think it's all of the above. Um, let's go into the first lecture from Mylea. Now you're going to meet Mylea Bayless, um, awesome person, as you will see. I'm going to tell you her screen on her face looks a little fuzzy in the video. We know it. It's not because it's buffering. There's no problem with it. It's just, it's just how the screen was. Mylea is a field biologist. She's in the field a lot. Um, and she was at a research station, as you'll see in this. It's really cool. Okay, here we go. Let's watch Malia. Hey everybody, welcome to the 2021 Pollinator Power Party. It's Pollinator Week. And I know you've heard a lot about bees and butterflies, but have you heard about bats and how they pollinate plants and the value that they bring worldwide to our agricultural systems because of their services, eating insects, dispersing seeds and pollinating plants. Bats are just amazing. Why don't we get started and we'll learn all about bats. And then we'll talk to Dr. Kristen Lear, who's an expert in bat pollination. And we're gonna take a trip to the field to the Trans-Pecos region of Texas with Kristen and I to learn how we collect the environmental DNA or eDNA of bats off of the flowers that they visit. And in between, we're gonna do a lot of fun activities and we're gonna have a great time together over the next hour. So y'all wanna get started? Let's go. We're gonna start by learning all about bats together. That'll give us an overview from which to learn the rest of the information we're going to talk about today. Bats belong to the order Chiroptera, which literally means hand wing. So if you hold up your hand like this and put it next to the bat wing on my screen, you'll see that the thumb and all the fingers um, actually correspond with the bones in the bat's wing. So this naming convention of hand wing makes tons of sense. Fossil records date back like 45 million years and bats pretty much then looked almost like modern bats. Recent estimates put bats 
on the record back 65 million years. And if this is true, they shared the worlds with, world with dinosaurs and they watched the dinosaurs extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. Although you might not see them, bats are everywhere and they're highly diverse. Bats occur across the globe with the highest species diversity occurring in tropical and subtropical areas. There's over 1,400 species of bats worldwide. The current count, I think, is 1,421. They make up almost 20% of all mammal species, and that's incredible. They vary in diversity of size and shape and behavior and ecology. They're just really amazing animals. In North America, we have eight bat families. Uh, Canada has 18 bat species. In the United States, we have 47 bat species. And Mexico wins with three times as many species, the most diversity at 139 species of bats. In northern parts of North America, including much of Canada and the United States, many species hibernate to survive those cold winter months and others migrate to warmer climates. In southern parts of the United States and most of Mexico, some bats migrate and others remain active year round. The, the diversity of life history strategies are as diverse as the bats themselves. Bats can roost in small colonies or large colonies. Some species even prefer to roost alone, just hanging among the tree leaves. They'll roost in abandoned mines and caves and rock outcroppings and in forests under the tree bark and in cracks or crevices or cavities. They're just everywhere and they're truly amazing. And sometimes bats can roost in human made structures as well, like uh, bat boxes that you can mount and install in your backyard or buildings of roofs and attics and under bridges in the crevices underneath the roads. Bats also eat all kinds of things. Globally, over two thirds of bat species are insectivorous. This includes species that glean insects from vegetation or hunt from perches, or some of them feed in flight and catch the insects while they're flying in the air. This is called aerial hawking. Herbivorous arthropods, uh, which are basically, you know, insects that eat plants, destroy approximately 25 to 50% of our crops worldwide. And the World Resources Institute estimates that over 400 pest species have evolved resistance to one or more pesticides. The Global Pest Control Ecosystem Services of bats ranges between 54 billion and 1 trillion US dollars. This estimate includes reduction in crop losses because the bats are eating the bugs that would otherwise be eating the crops, or also um, the indirect uh, cost reduction from the pesticides that don't have to be implied, applied because there are fewer bugs. And the United States alone, that estimate um, is more than $3.7 billion annually in benefit. Individual bats can eat thousands of insects every night, including many of those that um, damage our forests and agricultural crops. Things like corn earworm moths and gypsy moths and cucumber beetles and winter moths. For one species that's been extensively studied, the Mexican free tail bat, they've been documented to eat almost 70% of their body weight every night. And we've started to see the economic benefits of insectivorous bats in other parts of the world too. In Asia, bats are critical for sustainable rice production. Wrinkle-lipped bats in Thailand uh, were estimated to prevent the rice loss of 2,900 tons of rice annually by eating the plant hoppers that prey on the rice. This service was valued at over 1.2 million US dollars. And this means that bats protected the food for almost 26,300 people in Thailand. And we've also seen evidence of bats providing economic relief by eating pests of macadamia nut orchards in Africa and pests of cacao that's used to make chocolate in Indonesia. So it's just incredible the value that the insect eating services of bats provide to us all over the world. 
Bats also eat fruit and disperse seeds. More than um, 600 species of plants in 120 families depend on bats for seed dispersal, including a lot of pioneer plants that are the first to grow when a forest has been cleared or deforested. Vast expanses of the world's rainforests are cleared every year for logging and agriculture and ranching and lots of other uses. And fruit eating bats are key players in restoring those vital forests. Bats are so effective at dispersing seeds into these forest lands, um, these cleared forest lands, that they've been called the farmers of the tropics. Birds are effective seed dispersers too, but they're very wary of crossing large open spaces where flying predators can attack them. So they typically drop their seeds directly beneath their perches. But night foraging bats, on the other hand, are quite willing to cross clearings and leave their seeds in the clearings as they fly all the way across, scattering a lot more seeds than birds can in these cleared areas. Bats have been reported to disperse the seeds of acai, dates, figs, coffee, and cashews, and a whole lot of other plants. They're incredibly diverse and inherent and amazingly valu valuable. Um, and now we'll get to what we are here to talk about this week, pollination. Over 200,000 of the world's flowering plants rely on pollinators for reproduction, including 80% of the plants that we rely on for food. While a lot of attention has been placed on insect and bird pollinators, and rightly so, the role of bats as pollinators is not as widely recognized. Because bats are a lot larger and they have greater energy requirements, they're more reliable visitors to plants over and over, and they have the ability to carry large pollen loads at considerable distances to move that genetic material between plants that are farther away. Bat pollination occurs in over 500 species of plants from 67 plant families and 28 orders of angiosperms worldwide. And that's only what's documented. Most plants, flowering plants at least, can't produce seeds and fruit without cross-pollination. And this process also improves the genetic diversity of those cross-pollinated plants. Bats that drink the sweet nectar inside of flowers they pick up a dusting of pollen all over their faces or other body parts, and they move it along to other flowers as they feed. From deserts to rainforests, nectar feeding bats are critical pollinators for a wide variety of plants that have great economic and ecological value. Although bat pollination is relatively uncommon when compared to bird or insect pollination, it involves an impressive number of economically and ecologically important plants. Large-scale cash crops that are originally pollinated or dispersed by plants include wild bananas, mangoes, breadfruits, agave, durian, patai, and many more. They do this by using their long, specially adapted tongues to reach deep into the flowers of night-blooming plants to collect that nectar. In doing so, they accumulate pollen and they transport it to the next flower they visit. Because feeding on nectar or pollen requires relatively specialized morphology, that's their elongated snouts and tongues, lots of bats pollinate plants, but relatively few members of these families are obligate pollinators. If you're interested in a specific bat and plant interaction, there's a really great project called batplant.org that tracks the literature on ecosystem services of bats that drink nectar, eat fruit, and pollinated plants. And I've put the link here on the slide so you can check it out later. One great example of this is the bat pollinated agave tequiliana. It's the source of commercial tequila, a multi-million dollar industry in Mexico. Other species of agave are used locally to produce similar alcoholic beverages like pulque, mezcal, and bacanora. Agaves are also important sources of sisal fiber in many tropical locations. And although bats are not the exclusive pollinators of most species of agave, they are critically important pollinators in the tropical latitudes of the New World. This is also true of bats pollinating columnar cacti. For example, 
Bats are not the primary pollinators of two northernmost columnar cacti in the Sonoran Desert, although they do pollinate them, but they are nearly exclusively the pollinators of columnar cacti in south central Mexico and northern Venezuela. In India, the mawa tree is also called the honey tree or the sugar tree, and it's pollinated by bats. This is a tree that's both economically and culturally extremely valuable. The timber is used for making wagon wheels. The flowers are also called honey flowers and used for food in preparing a distilled spirit. The fruits are directly consumed by people and the oil extracted from the flowers and the seeds is incorporated into soaps and candles and cosmetics and also used medicinally. Extracts from the fruits are thought to prevent wrinkles and restore skin flexibility and seed cakes made from this tree are used as food for cattle and goats and are known to increase their milk production. How cool is that? And the same is true for trees like the kapok tree. And this tree is used to make pillows and mattresses and upholstery and installation insulation in Asia. And the balsa tree whose wood is the lightest commercially available lumber. And all thanks to bats. In the US, we have three species of bats that are pollen and nectar feeders. They're all found in the desert Southwest. They have long snouts and tongues that help them get deep inside those desert flowers. These three species are pollinators of agave and columnar cacti throughout Mexico and in the deserts of the Southwestern United States. We're gonna hear from Dr. Kristen Lear in our Pollinator Power Party presentation today, who's a pollinator specialist. And she's gonna talk more with us about these species of bats and their special relationship with the guppy. Thanks. Let's we'll hear the rest of it in a few minutes and we'll do some activities and meet with Kristen. Awesome. Okay. So let's go to our next polling question. Um, and I saw in the chat that a few people were having issues getting into the poll. I tried to put instructions in there. Um, yeah, I saw that. Um, so on your phone, if you go to poll EV, just www.pollev.com, and the username you put in is BATS, B-A-T-S, um, and, um, and then you can skip entering your name and get into the poll. So I, I got in, and I'm technically impaired for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so Hannah, is the, is the poll live? Looks like it's active. Our yes, question it's is, thank you. Our question is, um, how many nectar bat species are there in the United States? Hmm. Was everybody paying attention? Did Mylea just tell us that answer? Hmm. This is kind of a trick one because you know what the, the nectar feeding bats are gonna be the pollinator bats. Of course, there's carnivorous bats. Um, I guess I'll put my answer in. Also, while folks are answering this, um, the viscosity of the nectar in flowers is variable. Um, depending on what species of flower it is, how thick, right, the viscosity of it changes. And that actually is one of the factors that um, um, that associates which pollinator type is going to go and be interested in which flower. And the viscosity uh, is basically is a function of how much sugar content there is typically in the nectar itself. So uh, it determines some of the relationships between flo floristic resources and the pollinator species themselves. That's one thing. The other thing is like the depth of how long it's how long it is to reach the nectar, which they um, insects will reach with their long tongue, called the proboscis. Um, and so how long, if it's a tubular flower or not, it affects um, this as well. So bat species are gonna go for different nectar types for different reasons, several reasons, but one of them is that your viscosity of your nectar changes and it changes a hard, like a thick milkshake Rate versus like water. If you're sucking up a out of a straw, that's like a proboscis is like a big straw. So um, changes depending on the species. 
All right, so cool. So that's the so that's the answer. So Mylia and Christian are all right, and Christian are watching. <laughs> so okay. So it looks like a lot of people are choosing number three nectar species in the United States. Okay. All right, Hannah, let's roll to Kristen's section now. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Kristen Lear from Bat Conservation International. Now that we've heard a little bit about bats 101 and pollinating bats in general, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of my favorite pollinating bats, the ones that we have here in the U.S. So when we think of desert landscapes that we have here in the U.S. Southwest and across the world, we often think maybe there isn't as much diversity in these landscapes, but that really couldn't be farther from the truth. These desert landscapes that we have around the world are home to a huge diversity of plant and animal species and host some of the really cool pollinating bats that we'll be talking about today. So here in the US, we have three pollinating or nectar feeding bat species that are found in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, and a little bit into very, very Southern California. And these species are the one on the left, the Mexican long-nosed bat, which is an endangered species. We have the lesser long-nosed bat in the middle, which is recently delisted from the endangered species list here in the US, which is great. And then we have the Mexican long-tongued bat on the right, which is a little bit um, of a species that we just don't know as much about. And if we look at the range maps or the maps of where these two long-nosed bat species are found, we can see that they're found all the way from central Mexico all the way up to north East Mexico, Northwest Mexico, and then up into the US Southwest. And you can see they kind of have the two species have two different ranges with the Mexican long-nosed bat, the endangered one, coming up into Texas and a little bit into New Mexico. And this is the, the bat that we're gonna focus mostly on today. So these bats uh, are migrating very, very long distances, over 700 miles between central Mexico where they mate and then northern Mexico and the US Southwest where the moms give birth to their pup and raise their pup before migrating back south in the fall. So we have these cute little juvenile bats here um, and they roost in caves and mines. So protecting these caves and mines is a really important part of the conservation of these pollinating bat species. But when you think about this long distance migration, these bats have to eat along that 700 miles. So they need food resources. And these bats are feeding on the nectar of desert plants, including agaves, which we use to make things like tequila. And for the Mexican long-nosed bat in the northern part of their range, agaves are their only nectar source. So these plants are really important for these bats. And if you look at these agaves, these are tall, beautiful plants that put a stalk 30 feet tall, sometimes full of this energy rich nectar, this really sweet nectar. Um, and these bats love this nectar, just like, you know, birds and hummingbirds will drink nectar from these flowers, so will these bats. And so the bats are getting their nectar, their energy, and in turn, when they are they're drinking the nectar, these bats are getting covered in pollen. You can see they stick their faces inside the, the flowers and they get covered in pollen. And then they fly to different agaves and they spread that pollen around to these different plants and help pollinate these agaves. So without these bats, we would not have agave plants and we would therefore not have things like tequila. So these bats are very important for the agaves. Now agaves around the world, there's over 200 species of these agave plants all around the world. And Mexico has the highest diversity of agave plants. And these agaves are not just important food resource, resources for the bats, they are also very, very important resources for people. So especially in Mexico, many communities and rural people harvest agaves for many, many different uses. 
So they harvest the sugar or the sap to make beverages, to make drinks like, uh, like the tequila and mezcal, but other local, more traditional drinks. Uh, they cut down the stock that's really sugary and they boil it like sugar cane and you can eat it. They use the stocks for building fences and building houses. They also cut down the stalks and the leaves to feed to livestock like cattle. And they also plant the whole plants for things like living fences and to help control erosion. So these agaves are really, really important cultural and economic resources for people too. And if you just look at these beautiful plants, they are really iconic parts of the landscapes where they are found. So keeping agaves on the landscape helps both bats and people. But unfortunately, um, in a lot of different places, things like agricultural expansion, um, harvest, ranching, um, conversion to urban areas is decreasing agave population. So basically these bats, as they're migrating through that 700 miles are losing their food source. And if the people don't have agaves to use either, then they're losing their livelihoods. And so we at Bat Conservation International want to restore these agave plants to the landscape across that migratory range of the bats to help increase the bat population and provide resources for the people too. And so you can have these really cool high density um, agave stands where you have hundreds of flowering agaves for both the bats and the people, but it doesn't have to look like this. We can also have um, agave restoration or plantings that are part of living gardens or part of landscaping around people's houses or in the communities where we're working. So really this kind of bolstering of these agaves can happen at many different, um, different levels and with different people. And so this is the goal of Bat Conservation International's Agave Restoration Initiative, is to restore agaves and increase agaves around where the bats are roosting and across their migratory range for use by both bats and people. And I just wanna show this map again where the bats are ranging and you can see in the red stars, we have the locations of where we have been working to restore agaves. And you can see it's across that whole range. So this really is a landscape scale binational initiative uh, working between the US and Mexico. So one of the things that we're trying to do um, is find where these bats are. Um, these bats are really hard to study because they fly at night, they fly really far distances, um, and they're really hard to, to track. So we are launching a really cool project where we are using infrared cameras or IR cameras, uh, basically that use a, a spectrum of light that we can't see with our eyes and the bats can't see either. But these really cool cameras you can see in this picture can pick up this infrared light um, and we can watch the bats feeding on these agaves like you can see in this video. And then from that, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a tool where we, we basically swab or we cut the little flowers from the agaves where we saw the bats visiting and we're going to use eDNA or environmental DNA which is basically all the DNA that's left behind by the bat in their spit, in their, their snot, and their, from their fur when they feed from the flowers. So with using the, that eDNA, we are able to find where these bats are foraging and feeding without having to use all this fancy equipment and track them you know, individually. So we're really excited about this part of our research. And in a little bit, we'll take you live into the field to show you what, what we're doing and what it's like working out in the field on this project. And then of course, like I said, we are restoring agaves across the landscape. And so for our work, we're collecting native agave seeds from all the communities where we're working. Uh, we always pick native seeds, native agaves to bolster those populations. We're increasing local greenhouse capacity. Um, so we're helping communities build their own greenhouses where they can grow those agave seeds to little pups that we will then plant back out in the wild. And so to date, we've planted over 15,000 agaves in the US and Mexico to help feed these bats. 
So it's a really, really cool project that we've been working on. And then we've also, especially in Mexico, been working to support local sustainable agricultural and ranching practices using agaves. So again, helping the communities do these practices in a sustainable way so that they can benefit from the agaves as well as the bats. And so overall, this work that Bat Conservation International is doing really is supporting these bat populations and it's supporting the livelihoods of people. And so this is one of my favorite projects and I'm really excited that we got to talk about it for a little bit. Now, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out at my email. I'm always happy to talk about bats or help answer questions about our agave restoration initiative. Now, please join me as we come into the field in Big Bend National Park, Texas, to give you a little glimpse into the work that we're doing there. Okay, awesome. Okay, Hannah, let's, before we go to Big Bend, let's ask our next um, polling question. This one, the answer is three. So three species of nectar, nectar bat species in the United States. You guys were right on the money. Um, okay, so um, Kristen is now gonna take us onto her field site. So the question is in Texas, what plant are we monitoring for nectar bats? <laughs> That's a good question, Kristen. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> What's it gonna be, cactus, agave, or palm trees? Um, <laughs> we just, that's a, that's a tricky one. We just heard you talk a lot about one of those. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so that's the answer. Agave, um, that's a pretty good one. Okay, let's roll now into Kristen and go to taking into the field now. Thank you, Hannah. Hi, I'm Dr. Kristen Lear with Bat Conservation International, and we're here in Big Bend National Park, Texas. We are doing an agave restoration project where we are looking at eDNA of these agave plants. So basically, we're looking for the spit, the fur, the stuff left behind by the endangered Mexican long-nosed bat on these blooming agave flowers. And we're going to take a quick look at what they look like. What are you seeing up there? I'm seeing some wilted flowers. I'm seeing some open flowers with nectar. And I'm seeing a lot of insects. Yeah. So. Bats are not the only pollinators of agaves, but they're our favorite. Here we have an agave flower. We can see it up close. Um, on each group up there, there are a couple hundred of these little flowers. And basically what the bats do is they come and fly shove their little faces and their tongue inside the flower and we can open it up and see the nectar. So you can see some of that sweet, sweet nectar in there. And they get the sweet nectar and then they fly off and go about their night. Gosh, it's so pretty. We're all set up at night at the agave. We can see it here, nice and ready for the bats. And we're now kind of just waiting. Um, we have a little site and we're gonna wait to see till they come and feed on these agaves. And we have our camera, our infrared camera here. You can see lit up by IR lights, which uh, we cannot see, the bats cannot see them, but this special camera can so that we can watch the bats without them knowing that we're here. Unfortunately, we didn't see any bats tonight, but this is what we'll see when we do find them. Chowing down on the agave nectar to satisfy their sweet tooth and power their flight. 
Now wish us luck when we go back out tomorrow night. Okay, awesome. Okay, let's go to the next polling question. Hey, Kristen, um, why don't you turn on your camera and let's have you jump in here so everybody knows you're really there. If you're there, hey, yay, hello. Okay, unmute too. Okay, why Hi, everyone. don't you go ahead and, and pose this one. Okay, our next polling question is, what can you do to help bats? Uh, A, make your backyard bat friendly. B, learn about bats. C, share what you know. Or D, all of the above. While they're, you're giving them a minute to answer that, I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? Yep, go for it. Okay. So um, the agave um, plant, that's in a certain geographic range in the United States. Mm -hmm. So if we don't live in that range, then um, that's not necessarily something we could jump into and, and try to help with, is that right? Right, so they're mostly agaves are in like the Southwest US, like Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and that's where the, the pollinating bats are. Um, but I think Malia is going to talk a little bit about what you, what you can do, even if you don't have pollinating bats um, in your in your area. Um, there's definitely things you can do with uh, gardening for bats, um, creating habitat for bats. So we'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. Okay, cool. And just to kind of loop this in here, I'm going to just ask you another question about um, bat boxes. I'm going to shake up the mm -hmm. agenda here a little bit. So what yep. do you think about, um, I have a bat box in my backyard, um, am I helping or what, what's that doing? Good question. So bat boxes or bat houses, um, it's, it's kind of a complex topic um, because just like us, bats want, you know, good homes. Um, and so a lot of the kind of commercial bat houses on the market that you would find on Amazon, for example, aren't really the, the proper size or dimensions that bats need to have a good good home. Um, so at Bat Conservation International, we have some information on our website about um, you know the proper types of bat houses. Um, and in general, I mean, it's definitely a great tool to use um, if you want to attract or get bats in your yard. There's no guarantee that they'll work and get bats, but they do provide habitat um, in case bats need extra habitat, extra places to roost. Um, and they, um, like, like I said, they're really fun to watch if you get bats in it and you can watch them coming out in the evening. So mm -hmm. I, I really love watching bat houses. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right, let's go back now. So now we're going to go to um, how to help bats and Miley is going to jump in here. So let's switch to that, Hannah, and then we'll do, we'll check in with Mylia and uh, see what she, her thoughts are. So you might be thinking, I hope you're thinking, this is awesome. I learned so much about bats today. What can I do? How can I help bats every day in my life? Or some of the days, at least. Um, Bat Conservation International, the organization that both Dr. Lear and I work for, is dedicated to protecting bats all over the world. And we really believe that by protecting bats, we are doing a lot of other good things as well. We're protecting the functioning of those ecosystems worldwide. You heard about how bats are really important to dispersing seeds and m providing genetic uh, variability to native plants and recolonizing forests with pioneer plants as they drop those seeds and helping plants reproduce all over the world. We're ensuring food supplies for people by controlling those pests naturally. Bats help us do this by eating insects and pollinating plants and dispersing seeds of economically important plants and particularly in parts of the world where pesticides are not readily available and for those of us who are trying to produce our food sustainably and with fewer or without pesticides, bats are a critical piece of that puzzle. And we're also discovering medical and engineering advances, and we're on the verge of learning much more thanks to bats. 
One thing you can consider doing is making your backyard bat friendly. Don't use pesticides in your yard. Allow those insects to reproduce and the bats will eat them if you have bats in the area, which you most assuredly do. You could also consider putting up a bat house. And while that might not be um, something that saves bats from extinction, it normally helps the more common species. It will bring bats to your backyard and allow you the joy of watching bats in your yard emerging from your bat house. The other thing you can do is use native plants. Plant native plants in your yard, plants that um, are the food sources for all your native insects. And that's what most of our North American bats eat. You can learn more about bats. There are amazing resources to learn more. Dr. Kristen Lear, who you met today, is featured on an, um, with an organization called I Am a Scientist that puts together curriculum and learning materials for junior high and high school aged uh, school groups. Um, I, I found it fascinating and I am an adult. I learned a lot by looking at Kristen's I Am a Scientist page and there are other bat scientists featured here as well. And if you have younger children or if you yourself are a younger child, we also have some um, uh, information on Bat Conservation International's website. You can do activities with our Backyard Bativists um, series of videos, and you can learn about bats by watching the Bat Squad videos that were put together um, by BCI in partnership with some other organizations. So there's some great resources out there to continue learning more. And then as you learn more, you can help bats by sharing that information with others. One great way to do this is by having a party. Have a party, have some bat foods at your party, make some bat drinks at your party, drinks and foods that are um, filled with ingredients that benefit uh, by, are benefited by bats. And there's a whole cookbook that you can see at batweek.org and also at pollinator.org that has recipes for both pollinated foods and then bat assisted foods. You might also think about having an event during Bat Week, which is in October. And you can find the information at batweek.org here on this website. And it has all kinds of examples of different activities and different events you can have to share your knowledge and love of bats with your friends, including Bats Live, which is um, a way that you can watch videos and you can actually even check out bat trunks, like a trunk of educational materials full of bat things. So check out batweek.org and check out pollinator.org and you'll get some great ideas about how to have an event or a party or something and you can share what you've learned with other people. And you can also join BCI to learn more. We have um, a newsletter that you can sign up for that keeps you up to date on new bat information. And we are a membership based organization. So anything that you give to BCI goes directly into bat conservation. And that's a way that we can help bats together um, all over the world. Thanks for joining us today. We really enjoyed our time with you. If you have more questions about bats, you can reach Dr. Kristen Lear and I at this information on the slide. I hope that you enjoy your day and we're gonna do a couple activities before we wrap up today and say goodbye to you. Thanks for being here and learning about bats and their pollination services mm -hmm. during this 2021 Pollinator Week. Okay, Hannah, let's do our final question for the group. So we're going to go back to the weighted word cloud and just see how um, your thoughts are, have changed about bats. And Mylia and Kristen, if you can unmute and show your cameras, that'd be really cool. Um, Mylia, hello. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So um, while Hannah's pulling up that final, we're just going to see how you know, per thoughts have changed um, over the last 45 minutes on bats. And I saw um, this information that you sent in that the agave 
only flowers once in its lifetime and then mm -hmm. it's dead. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is true. So um, agaves are crazy plants. They spend five, 10, 20 years growing and maturing and then they shoot up this like 30 foot tall flowering stalk that we saw in the videos um, full of nectar. And that only happens once. And then they die after that, that event. Um, yeah, they're, they're crazy plants um, for sure. So if I, if I like um, tequila, am I um, taking the bat habitat? If, am I really messing up the bat situation if I drink tequila? It's a good question. They're, um, it's a very complex system with tequila, but there actually is a bat-friendly tequila and mezcal label uh, that producers can participate in um, by Dr. Rodrigo Medellin and the Tequila Interchange Project. Um, and so you can you look for the bat-friendly tequila and mezcal uh, with a little bat label on it. I have never found it in the stores. I think it's kind of pretty rare in certain stores, but I'm, I'm still looking. Um, but, you know, there is um, that recognition that bats are really important for agaves and that while the current industrial system of tequila production is really, you know, pretty bad for the environment, um, there is recognition that probably something needs to be done about that. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. So, Mylia, a question for you. You can see the weighted chart coming in, right, um, and how the words are changing. What are your thoughts, Mylia? I mean, you guys, so you guys are committing your careers to bat, right? The rest of us are just trying to sort of get over, you know, some misperceptions about these dark sort of black, they seem kind of creepy deals, right? Um, so Mylia, tell us a little bit, what do you think of the weighted word chart? Give us a little bit of perspective on kind of why you love bat so much. I, I love this word cloud because if you remember back to the beginning, um, the things that people reflected on were um, uh, sort of uh, sort of external observations, right? Nighttime and vampires and things that you see in here and maybe uh, things that are based in popular culture or maybe a limited understanding. And I love to see people um, just expressing uh, an appreciation for how important and essential bats are. And apparently everyone likes to drink because tequila <laughs> is the biggest one. So you all go out and find some bat-friendly tequila um, and then use it as a reason to tell your friends about bats. I bet if you invite people over for a drink or a bat-pollinated fruit salad and use that as a reason to um, educate them a little bit, that, you know, that's a fun way to spread the word. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you guys are awesome. You guys are so great. Um, you know, these women that are out in the field and working hard and working on bats and like taking eDNA. I mean, talk about like incredible, right? I'm so thankful for you taking the time to talk to us. I'm super proud of you. I know that sounds sort of weird, but like I'm proud to be a fellow like scientist, right? And you guys are given this model of, of dedication and creativity and your non-competitive attitude and sharing is just so refreshing and beautiful. We're all working towards the same thing and together. So you guys are the bomb. Um, yeah, thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. <laughs> thank you for having us. This has been great. Participate. I mean, this is amazing. I think we're gonna reach a million people and I love that. Uh-huh. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's switch now. We're going to give this back to Hannah to take us into our breakout room. Great. Thank you so much. All right, guys, just like uh, the past two days, we have our two storytellers sessions. Today is AEP and TVA. Um, those sessions are live and ready to get started. We'll give you a minute or two to head over there, but we are ready for you. You can go to the homepage under my event and see the extra sessions listed under upcoming sessions. Uh, just a quick reminder that this is only for registered attendees. So if you're watching through YouTube, this is not an option for you right now. It's just an option for folks who are registered and on the platform. Last thing, it's under event. Um, just click on my event and it's upcoming sessions and you'll see both of them listed there. 
Okay, thank you guys so much. If you don't join a storyteller session, be sure to join us back here tomorrow for our last session of Pollinator Week. Thanks so much.